We're going to start at Revelation 2.17. All right. Yep. So we're back. Uh, this is uh, what our fourth session now. Uh, Brother Doug is going to continue reading uh, regarding Revelation chapter 2. But we were just left off talking about uh, the term tribulation saints not really being literally in the text. But it can be assumed based on Revelation chapter 14 talking about the 144,000, that's the context. That's really what's being spoken about. And they are the ones who have endured and come out of the troubling times. So when it's talking about the patience or the endurance of the saints, you know, it's talking about those who have endured through that tough time. So I think that's kind of where they get that title from. But with that being said, I'm going to give it over to Brother Doug. All yep. yours, Doug. All right, I'm not going to take too much time, but right right away I just want to explain to people in your modern English Bibles, it will say church where it's supposed to say assembly or ecclesia. In the original Greek New Testament, it should be assembly in English. Um, ecclesia actually should have been translated as assembly, so I just wanted to say that real quick. Um, Revelations chapter 2, verse 17. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I shall give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I shall give him a white stone, and on the stone a renewed or new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now that's interesting because Yahushua in Revelation says he has been given a new name or he has a new name that no one knows. So I find that correlation between us and Yahushua is kind of interesting. Um, the white stone can be translated as the brightly illuminated instead of white. Um, where's the Strong's number? This appears to be a reference back to the Urim and Thummim, the stones of determination. Where? Chapter and verse, bud. No scripture. Determination of the ephod of the priest, the overcomers are affirmed in their identity as the remnant of Yashrael by these stones. So I don't see any scripture here, so I'm going to kind of ignore that. Um, the Great Tribulation will be a three and a half year period beginning in the season of winter and concluding in the season of summer. Just before the biblical appointed times of trumpets, atonement and tabernacles the greater exodus will be Yahuwah's method of deliverance for this time through the leadership of the 144,000 the various escaping camps those who are delivered will dwell in mobile shelters also known as um, Sukkot the psalmist says it's best so he's finally going to show some scripture here and this is Psalms chapter 91, verses 5 to 11. You are not afraid of the dread by night, of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that walks in darkness, of destruction that ravages at midday. A thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it does not come near you. Only with your eyes you look on and see the reward of the wrong ones. Because you have made you who are my refuge, the most high, your dwelling place. No evil befalls you, and a plague does not come near your tent. For he commands his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Um, okay, so I'm guessing he's trying to use this to back up what he just said in the earlier paragraph. I don't know if this is really end times, though. I've this is a very general psalm, um, so I don't know if I agree with that this could be used to back up his stance. Um, I think it's just a general psalm talking about, you know, that um, many will fall at Yahushua's side. It could be end times. It couldn't be. You know, I, I don't know. Right. I agree, Doug. Uh, <laughs> like, there we go again. I mean, yeah. we got to read the context, too, of the chapter, but... I guess so. If it's general, I guess it could apply any at any time in the past, present, or future. So I would hope that in the great, great tribulation in the second exodus that this scripture would manifest and would become reality. I would, I would hope that would be the case. 
where will they go question mark when yashrael left egypt they went to the wilderness the prophets say the same will happen for those believers who escape from their homes cities and countries however it is called the wilderness of the peoples i don't see that uh i don't see that term anywhere literally meaning people will be out of the cities and various nations okay let's see if he's going to give scripture for this ezekiel chapter 20 verses 33 to 38 as i live declares the master yahua do not i with a strong hand with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out reign over you and i shall bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the lands where you are scattered hmm so you who is going to bring us out of the land you mean um he's you mean um the the zionists don't bring people into israel no, it seems like prophecy is fulfilled by Yahuwah himself. And I shall bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I shall bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. Okay, it is in There's search. a term. <laughs> there we go. I stand corrected. And, and, uh, shall and, 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 and real quick, if I could just say, uh, just keep an open mind because... Yahuwah used Moses to bring them out of Egypt. So Yahuwah could use, use Israelites to gather the Israelites without the credit going to the Israelite. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. So it's possible. So just keep that in mind. But, you know, I don't think the Ashkenazi, <laughs> Ashkenazi guys are going to be the ones doing it. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I was basically saying. I, I was kind of mocking the 1948 claim by Christians. I hear that's, you, but... that's what I was basically doing by saying Zionists. All right, go ahead. You can continue. Um, and I shall bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and shall enter into judgment. Wow, judgment. Hmm. With you face to face there as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I shall enter into judgment with you, declares the master Yahuwah, and I shall make you pass under the rod hmm. and enter into judgment with you. Now, it's interesting the term rod because we know that Yahushua, according to Revelation chapter 12, he is, a man, he is the man child that will rule the nations with a rod of iron. So I kind of like the, the terminology used here, pass under the rod and shall bring you into the bond of the covenant and purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. Wow, that's pretty harsh. From the land where they sojourn, I bring them out, but they shall not come into the land of Yashrael, and you shall know that I am Yahuwah. This is one of the most dramatic. Yeah, this is my, this is my favorite passage to prove that there is a second exodus. This is like... For me, this verse does it all. I mean, there's no, no more to be said after this one. Uh, it's another wilderness. Um, let me go here again. There's going to be a purging, just like there was a purging with the first wilderness. Uh, you know, that older generation didn't make it into the promised land, but the younger generation did. Uh, so, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be execution of judgment. There's going to be purging um, and he's going to bring us into the bond of the covenant. Mm. That to me is so essential, you know, because the, the, the context of what he's speaking is he's talking about the covenant that he established with the, with Israel in the first wilderness, which is basically the marriage with the terms and conditions, which includes the Torah the laws and commandments and statutes. So Christians, I don't know how Christians get around this and think that this is going to be some different, it's going to be completely different when what he's trying to do is he's, he's, he's trying to get us to bring us into the bond of the covenant. He's not saying a covenant, the bond of a covenant. He's saying the bond of the covenant. So it's speaking of a specific covenant. And although it might be new, as Jeremiah 31 says, it's a new covenant. 
it doesn't mean that the terms and conditions are different. It's reestablished. Just like I say all the time on here, if I have a lease to an apartment, when that lease is up, we got to re-sign the lease. The terms and conditions are the same. The first lease gets thrown away or we put it, stick it away in a file. But it's not, it's, no, it's, lo, it's void. It's no longer active. The new lease is active now. But the new lease has the same terms and conditions as last year. Maybe they might have added a few things. You know, maybe there's some new rules. But other than that, that's what it's all about. It's a marriage, it's a marriage covenant, really, that's being reestablished. That's what the father is doing. Israel is his bride. Yahuwah is the bridegroom. Yeah, uh, Yisrael is the bride. And this is what he's doing. I love this. This passage for me is like, passages like this is really, for me, does it all for this subject. All right, Brother Doug, go ahead. All right. This is one of the most dramatic and explicit descriptions of the greater Exodus using the very language that Yahuwah used in bringing the children of Yashrael out of Egypt. Yahuwah directly compares the greater exodus, the wilderness of the peoples, to the exodus speaking of his judgment upon the world, rendering judgment upon those in camp who will rebel, as he did with Korah, Dathan, and Biram. Um, in number 16 of the exodus, even Yahuwah's purpose remains the same for the greater exodus as with the exodus, and you shall know that I am Yahuwah. The book of Revelation also describes two individuals who will also play a role in addition to the two groups of the 144,000 servants and tribulations saints. They are not specifically identified. Consensus among Bible scholars holds that they are Moses and Eliyahu reincarnated or those in the spirit of Moses and Eliyahu. What is profound about them is not who they might be, but instead what they do. They pronounce the tribulation judgment from Yahuwah to the world. Revelations chapter. I agree with that last. I agree with that. Most of that paragraph. Um, I don't think they're going to be reincarnated. No. It doesn't matter whether they are or not, but I think they'll be resurrected or mm -hmm. just like anybody else. But I think it's important. I think. I like what they said there at the end. It's not important of who they are as much as what they're doing. So definitely what they're doing, these two witnesses is essential. Mm -hmm. That was a good statement. I, like um, I agree with part of the second part. I think, I think personally, just because of what happened, the only two guys that didn't suffer death in scripture, I believe could possibly, um, their spirits could be in the two witnesses. I believe that Enoch and, um, Eliyahu, their spirits will be in the two witnesses because those were the only two guys that never suffered death. And uh, I think they're reserved for a special job from Yahuwah. Um, anyway, Revelations chapter 3 to um, Revelations chapter 11, verse 3 to 5. And I shall give to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days clad in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that are standing before the Elohim of the earth. And if anyone wishes to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and consumes their enemies. And if anyone wishes to harm them, he has to be killed in that way. So I find it interesting, the two olive trees, um, you know, Jeremiah talks about you know, olive tree, olive tree with goodly fruit, Romans 11. The Apostle Paul talks about the olive tree of Yashra'al and the olive tree of the Gentiles and being grafted in from a cultivated olive tree to a, nat a natural olive tree. So I found that interesting from that verse. Um, this prophecy tracks with the Exodus as well. Moshe and Aharon were the two witnesses before Pharaoh. They warned Pharaoh and the Egyptians and then introduced the judgments of Yahuwah upon Egypt. There is a striking pattern. I, oh, I, would, I would say that the uh, two lampstands, sorry, Doug, just real quick. Uh, the two lampstands, in my opinion, would not be Gentiles and Israelites, but the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Mm. Two olive trees, two lamps. Um, it would make more sense because the Gentiles need to be grafted in. 
they're not going to be protected and accepted if they're not grafted in, if they don't repent from their sins and turn to Yahusha, Messiah. Mm -hmm. So, but you sparked that idea in my head. So you get credit for sparking that, that idea. Cause I definitely didn't have any thoughts about the two, two olive trees until you said something. So good stuff. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot more sense that it would be Judah and Israel. Um, this prophecy tracks with the Exodus as well. Moses and Aharon were the two witnesses before Pharaoh. Now, uh, I don't know if I agree with that. They warned Pharaoh and Egyptians and then introduced the judgments of Yahuwah upon, the, upon Egypt. Just quick, uh, the reason I don't agree with him on this is because they didn't breathe out fire. They didn't do what the two witnesses do in Revelations. So I, I just slightly disagree with him on this. There is a striking pattern, I, the ten judgments that fell on Egypt. The first can be sub, subdivided into three sets. This pattern is visible based on the location of the judgment announced by Moses and Aaron. The three sets of judgments were presented first at the Nile River, then at the palace. Finally, they were unannounced. Only the final judgment, the death of the firstborn, does not conform to this pattern pattern setting it apart from the others the same peculiarity is true of the great tribulation however it is much more visible there are three sets of seven judgments seals trumpets and plagues, followed by the day of yahuwah just as moses introduced these judgments to pharaoh in egypt it appears that two witnesses will announce the judgments to anti-messiah in the world the prophecy of the two witnesses says they will do this during all the days of the three and a half year great tribulation only to be killed and bodily resurrected in the days immediately following the law teaches that you must have two or three witnesses to establish truth hallelujah thus the witnesses uh the witness of Moses and Aaron to Egypt established the truth of Yahuwah's message in that day. Some have argued that the judgments that fell on Egypt occurred naturally and were not by the hand of Yahuwah, but they forget that Moses and Aaron announced them beforehand. This proved that the judgment was by Yahuwah's hand. Hallelujah. The same will likely happen in the Great Tribulation. Yahuwah will likely use natural and providential elements in his judgments. Uh, I would have to look up what that word means, providential. But when the two witnesses speak to the judgment precisely beforehand, it will establish the truth of matter. The two witnesses will testify to you as judgments upon the earth, even though they may have natural explanations. The book of Revelations also describes the greater exodus by comparing Yashra Al and the remnant as a woman fleeing into the wilderness. It is a picture of remnant Yashra Al escaping the great tribulation and a great sign was seen in heaven a woman so this is revelations chapter 12 verse 1 to 6 and a great sign was seen in the heaven a woman clad with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars and being pregnant she cried out in labor and pain to give birth and another sign was seen in heaven see a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head and his tail draws a third of the stars of heaven, angels, and throws them down to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth and to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a man child who was to shepherd all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught away to Yahuwah and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by Yahuwah to be nourished there 1,260 days. Now I'm guessing that's where they get the three and a half years from. Um, the description of the woman is a depiction of Yashra Al bringing forth the Messiah with the devil on the attack. The child is the Messiah who will rule all nations with a rod of iron. Then it describes how Yashra El will escape at the end like an exodus into the wilderness and be protected for 1260 days, which is the same length of days given for the two witnesses. Interesting. Um, so far, I'm liking that, liking that interpretation. Pretty decent. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, I can't, I don't think I could add anything to that. 
Okay, um, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5. Yahushua spoke of this prophecy just as Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5, did in indicating that those in Yahuda or Judea, the area surrounding Jerusalem, we'll have to test that, that's true, would have to escape into the wilderness when the abomination desolation was set up. By the way, this is the same place where the scapegoat, um, known as Azazel, is taken on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. This is the secondary event of abomination and desolation that began the day count of the Great Tribulation. Therefore, the greater exodus begins with the start of the Great Tribulation. That would make sense. The bulk of the Tribulation saints, those scattered in the nations, will escape to the wilderness of the peoples at the Passover that immediately follows. They will be only days apart. Sounds plausible, but I don't know if that's a guarantee it's going to be at Passover. That's It's a cool possibility. I don't know if it's um, definite. That's just right. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a jump, a bit of an assertion. Um, but I'd like to see if they can bring more scripture. Yeah. So, so far they're bringing Matthew 24, my favorite chapter in the Gospels talking about the tribulation. Um, so when you see the abomination that lays waste, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, set up in the set-apart place, he who reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Yehuda flee to the mountains and pray that your flight does not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. I love that verse because that proves that Yahushua set importance on the sabbath he said make sure that pray that your flight does not take place in winter or on the sabbath so he's putting emphasis on that verse 21 for then there shall be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be and i just want to add real quick where um yahush is actually getting this from in the old testament um, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, is where Daniel talks about the abomination desolation. So I'm going to read that real quick. And, okay. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolator. So I just wanted to add that. That's where Yahushua is getting that in Matthew 24. That's where he's just, getting it from. Yeah. Let me share something real quick on this. So a lot of, a lot of people, um, especially those who are anti Torah um, would see this as something that passed already. They would see this as speaking of uh, 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Um, it can be that, uh, especially because it says this generation shall not pass, and so forth and so on in verse 24. But because of the fact that it says there shall be great distress, such as has not been since the beginning of the world, uh, I would expect there to be something bigger. Uh, in what's called the Great Tribulation, <laughs> or the great, the great and awesome Day of Yahuwah, or whatever you, however you want to put it, uh, the day the 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 final end time Messiah is on the earth. I would like to think that there's going to be worse troubling times than what happened in 70 A.D. So, I would like to believe this is this could be double prophecy as well. Um, just wanted to say my defense. For that. Yeah, my defense is read Second Thessalonians chapter two, because Paul is talking about future when he talks about the man of lawlessness being revealed, meaning that he wasn't revealed in his time. So that's that's where I would have my defense is that Paul is talking about a future event with the abomination desolation, because he talks about. He's going to claim to be Elohim. He's going to walk into the temple of Elohim, sit on the throne, and declare that he's Yahuwah. So that I think in context of Thessalonians chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's definitely future. 
Cool. Brother Doug, Chris has got her hand up. I'm going to unmute yeah. her real quick. Okay. Oh, looks like I don't Shalom, have... Shalom, Brother D. It's Bobby. Hey, yeah, listen. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, go ahead. I've heard that also, but in the last verse of that, Matthew and 21, it says, For then there shall be a great distress. Such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. So they can't use that for 70 AD because... They're talking about a bigger tribulation at the end times. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I I I kind of agree because I I I have a feeling that 70 AD was worse than any of the other times the temple has been sacked by Gentiles. Um, and again, it's been the longest time. I mean, a lot of stuff happened during that time. You had um, Rome. You had uh, Alec. You know, the the I forgot what country it was, but it it was really bad. You know what I mean? Really, really bad. And uh, the Yahudim and everybody was being persecuted uh, pretty bad during that time. So I don't, I don't. Me personally, I don't ignore that this could be talking about seventy A.D. Uh, but. I see both, but I hear what you're saying, man. Yeah, I just say because it says, nor ever shall be. Isn't the worst time, the tribulation at the end? You yeah. Know, just by those Absolutely. last four words, it says, Absolutely. nor ever shall be. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, yes. That's a good point. Yes. That's so if that point. was the worst of the tribulation, I guess it's not going to be so bad this time. Is right, that what right. These people nah, are saying? Yeah, no, nah, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, oh, right. Because I've heard that stated that way before, but when I bring up those last four words, and they're like, "No, no, no," they don't want to touch on that. They don't yeah. want to touch on those four. <laughs> That's a good yeah. point, Bobby. That's really good. Nor yeah. ever shall be. That's yeah. good. Hmm. I might have to change my stance on that one. Hmm. Good stuff. Very good. <clears throat> Glad you put emphasis on that, brother Bobby. Cause that's what it says. Huh? We're muted. All right, Kristen. Anything? <laughs> no, I said I said the same thing, and oh. then he pushed the button. So, nice. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Very good observation. I love it. Thanks. Yeah, that was back when I debated the Church of Christ pastor and his son, who uh, you know he brought that up with Matthew twenty four. I was like, all right, whatever. <laughs> back then i didn't know what to say to it you know why because they see that evil word sabbath that they yes, don't like exactly and because yeah. of that one word because yeah. of that one because when you try to bring out that one word <laughs> sabbath that's so yeah. evil to them because yes. they, they actually have to to praise elohim that day i don't know why right. it's so evil it's a day of rest <laughs> and a day of scripture but to them it's like right. that's armageddon to them that, that's the tribulation <laughs> having to have the sabbath because they got to remember all that he created, all yeah. his creation, and all he's done. Because you mentioned that one word, they have to flip the whole verse into 70 AD. It can't be any other time. But then when you bring up, nor ever shall be, then they're like, but no, this happened already. But they won't explain those last four words. You're Hallelujah right, bro. Shabbat. <laughs> You're right, man. Very, very good point. Thank you for sharing, man. All right, brother Doug, where we at? Save those for me. <laughs> brother Doug, where we at, buddy? Yeah, okay, let me get back here. Yeah, I just wanted to add to for me personally, I don't think 70 AD could be could be any type of fulfillment of that prophecy because no man was in the temple in 70 AD declaring himself as Yahuwah. So that's my stance. If the if abomination desolation happened in 70 AD, great. I would stand corrected. But as far as I know, it didn't happen then. So there, there's only been two fulfillments, historically speaking. I'm just going to do uh, say it real quick. Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple of Yahuwah and forced the Yahudim to sacrifice a pig to a, to a statue of Zeus. 
that worldwide, even by the Jews, consider that a a um, a first installment or first fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. So I just wanted to add that. If it happened in the past, that's when it happened. And Yahushua most likely is referring to that when he's speaking to his disciples. He's probably, in my opinion, he's saying, you know, when you see that happen again, you know, so because the book of Maccabees talks about anyone that wants to look into it, first and second Maccabees talks about that. Um, we're at Revelations chapter 12, verse 13 to 17. And when the dragon that he had been saw that he had been thrown to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the man child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And out of his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river after the woman to cause her to be swept away by the river. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to fight with the remnants of her seed. Now you go to Genesis chapter three, we understand that the seed of the woman is where Yahusha comes from. Originally starts at Eve and the age old battle between the two seeds, the seed of the serpent versus the seed of the woman, or we know it as the seed of Messiah in Genesis chapter three, I think it's verse 15. So I'm gonna continue. Verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to fight with the remnant of her seed, those guarding the commands of Yahuwah and possessing the witness or faith of Yahushua Messiah. A sudden flash flood in the Yahudim hills and mountains is the reason for the sudden escape, by the way. Flash flooding in the springtime is a common and deadly occurrence in the Holy Land east of Jerusalem. Apparently, this is the first element of protection prophesied for the greater exodus. This actually parallels the crossing of the Red Sea and Israel's dramatic deliverance. The crossing of the Red Sea was Yahuwah's salvation made visible. But in the greater exodus, Yahuwah opens the earth to swallow a deluge of flood instead of parting the waters. We cannot leave this passage without noting the phrase, the wings of the great eagle. It's a direct reference to the Exodus. Moses used this very word picture to describe the Exodus out of Egypt. Okay, so he does give a verse here to support that. Deuteronomy 32, verse 11. As an eagle stirs up its nest, flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, bearing them on its wings. So that's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11. When the book of Revelation says that the dragon goes off to make war with the rest of Yashrael's offspring, it is referring to the tribulation saints scattering elsewhere, been the world during the great tribulation. Where do these fleeing Yehuda and Deluge go? The only description we have is into the wilderness to her place. Obviously, Yahuwah will have prepared a place for them to escape the great tribulation. Some have suggested that the place could Petra, a famous place in Korda that Yashrael used to prepare entry into the land. We're not good with geography, so please don't ask me about geography and about these places I've never heard of in my lifetime. I tend to think that they will make it back to the base of Mount Sinai in Arabia. Regardless of where it is, they will return to the land in the way and manner Yahuwah purposed it, purposed in the Exodus with faith in Yahuwah's provision, protection, and promises. Finally, the book of Revelation describes a set of... I agree strongly with that last sentence. Yeah. Definitely. Wow. Yeah, I like the Mount Sinai. I definitely like that. I hope that's true. I like Mount Sinai in Arabia and uh, return to the land in the way Yahuwah wanted it, paraphrasing.
Finally, the book of Revelation describes a set of two harvests, or, well, you could have also used Matthew 13, but we're not going to go there. The first is a harvest unto Yahuwah's kingdom, while the latter is a harvest unto Yahuwah's judgment. Again, Matthew 13, everyone who's listening in, please check that out. The first harvest is described this way. And I looked and saw a white cloud. Now, this is Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 to 16. And I looked and saw a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the son of Adam, having on his head a golden crown in his hand, a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the dwelling place, crying with a loud voice to the one sitting on the cloud, Send your sickle and reap. Because the hour has come for you to reap, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Ooh, this blends so well with Matthew chapter 13. Wow, I'm going to have to write down a reminder of this. And the one sitting on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. This is a. Kristen's got her hand up, brother Doug. Kristen's got her hand up. Hold on. Let's get her in here real quick. She had a map, too. I saw she put up a map. Go ahead, Kristen. Sorry, Bobby. I didn't mean I didn't mean to raise my hand. I just uh, the map was a picture with uh, Mount Sinai on it, just showing its location. Can you show it again? Are you able to do yeah. that again? Go ahead. Let's see if we can. Can you see it? Yep. So you see, isn't it interesting how it's like right there in the middle? Between the water? Yeah. Yeah. So that, have whole, so that whole river e thing, the whole river thing that they were saying in this article is not too far-fetched, huh? No, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. Not if we all end up at Mount Sinai. Man, I wonder how we're going to get there. <laughs> hmm. Yahoo will make a way, huh? Yeah. It's going to be great. It's going <laughs> to be great. Really good. Cool. Good stuff. Thank you for showing. Sure. Let's see. Nice. That was great. Cool. Look at that interaction we got. <laughs> cool. We got less than a minute left. We might as well end here and then continue. We'll finish this up. Might as well finish this up. We're right at the end. Um. So where we at, Brother Doug, real quick, hopefully before the video ends? Oh, I'm sorry, I got you muted. Are you able to unmute yourself this time? No? Okay. Got you. Boom. Where we at, real quick, before we get Revelations out? Revelations 14, 14 and 16. You are the man. All right, with that, we'll end and come back in.